everyone. It is 6.30, so we will go ahead and get started. I tend to speak pretty loudly and don't need a microphone, but can you hear me in the back? Okay, good. Then we'll, we'll go with this. Um, I generally like to walk around when I talk, but this is something that we promised staff and community that we'll make available to them. So Ray is filming this this evening, and so I've promised I will stay anchored here for the purpose of his video. Um, welcome. We're really glad uh, to see such a great turnout. Uh, lots of new faces in helping us with uh, our discussions of budget, uh, which is a good thing, and yet uh, probably uh, a bad thing because you realize that we really do have some challenges facing us this year um, and need a lot of staff and community input. But again, thank you for being here tonight. Why are we here? Well, the purpose of our budget study committee is to provide the stakeholders with input into the decision making process by offering suggestions to us, to helping us solve problems and just giving us feedback on budget reducing ideas uh, that are brought forward. Um, and also to educate staff and community members about the budget and related issues because many times people have ideas about things that they think could happen with the budget and they're curious as to, you know, why, why didn't you think about this? Uh, and they just don't understand all the complexities that go into school finance. So not only will we be spending some time talking about budget issues and ways to reduce the budget, but also a little bit about how school finance works. So I hope that because you are a part of this process, you will take some of the information that you receive either here at meetings that we have or things that I might um, send out to you over the course of time and that you will pass that on to other stakeholders who were not able to be here tonight. <coughs> Our goals are this, to develop a flexible plan so that we can respond efficiently as a district to decreases and to increases, both in revenue and in student enrollment. I'll talk a little bit about that as we go forward, but I really think that the, the real trick in what we're trying to do here with our budget solutions is that we're preparing for some tough times that may be ahead of us for a year or two, uh, but then there's some potential, I think, that things could turn around. And so we wanna make sure that we have a, a really good solution that we put into place for the district that don't destroy programs that then we might want to put back into place later. So how do we, how do, we do things with our budget that make us nimble so that we can respond to changes in enrollment, both up and down, and to changes in school funding, which uh, have the potential to increase eventually um, with the schools for fair funding uh, school finance lawsuit that is still playing out in our court system. Um, also, to make decisions that best support the long-term quality and sustainability of our district programs, to maintain programs and policies that enable all students to enjoy a well-rounded public education, and to protect or even enhance programs we have that attract and retain student enrollment in 308, because we certainly have a very unique situation in Reno County where we realize students really do have a choice where they go. They can either choose to live in the 308 boundaries and attend a different community school system, or perhaps they live in another community and it's very easy for them to attend the 308 school system. So we don't want to do anything with our programs that might drive students away that live in our boundaries or that uh, don't attract students from outside because Hutchinson District can only grow really uh, by continuing to bring kids in from outside of our boundaries. So those are all things that we have to be very mindful of. <coughs> we have some really unique challenges in the, the few years ahead of us because we have a lot of uncertainty with our budget and we even have some uncertainty with where our enrollment is headed. As far as our budget, uh, certainly the current level of state finance would cause us to question what's going to happen with school budgets. Uh, I did get some, some hopeful news Thursday. I was in, in Topeka for a meeting and was visiting with Dale Dennis. He's the director of school finance who you know, basically 
said some things that gave me a little bit of cause for hope. He said, you know, it, it seems like the money for education is remaining in the budget. I don't have any idea where that money is going to come from, but I believe that maybe our governor and our legislators get it, that they're under a court order to fund schools. The rest of the schools for fair funding lawsuit is still pending. I have received word that we're expecting a decision on that really at any time. That's not going to have to go back to court and have any additional evidence presented. I would guess within the next 30 days we'll have the district court ruling on that. That'll get uh, appealed to the Supreme Court because whoever loses will appeal. Um, and sometime within the next year, we'll probably see that Supreme Court decision come down. When that happens, I believe then we'll see school funding uh, increase back to the kind of levels maybe that it was um, before the recession hit. Again, I don't know where Kansas will come up with that money. They may have to make some changes in their tax policies again. But I think we have the potential for revenue to eventually increase. But in the short term, I don't think we're going to be getting any cost of living increases to operate the district on, and that causes some challenges. Um, enrollment uncertainty. We have a bit of a trend right now for some declining enrollment. It's not huge, but our largest class that we have right now in our school system is this year's senior class. So when they graduate, we'll probably decline about 20 to 25 students if you look at the number of kids coming through the system. So unless something changes, we'll have to deal with that drop of enrollment. And, you know, at when you figure weighted enrollment, six or seven thousand dollars a student, you know, you do the math, that is a sizable amount of funding that we have to plan not to have next year and the year after. So we have to budget for that. Um, but then there are some things that might cause our enrollment to grow, but it's purely speculation. Uh, we have the Wiley Building that has now been constructed. Soon they will be taking in tenants. That's in the Lincoln Boundary. We have um, the Oxford Estates that's in the Wiley Boundary. That's a new housing development that's uh, being opened up right now. Um, in the Lincoln Boundary, uh, there are some tax credits that have been given. They're going to raise apartment complexes and put some new ones in place. That might attract additional families. You know, it's just difficult to tell how all of that is going, going to come together. And then we've received word that we do have, you know, a new industry that's coming to town. And so there'll be construction jobs and then some long-term employment of about 150 jobs in the spinoff from that. How will that impact enrollment? It's really difficult to tell. So we have to plan to be flexible with what we do. I want to stress, no decisions have been made. We're just starting this conversation with our staff and our community officially this evening. Of course, rumors are rampant. I've already been told that the rumors out there were closing three schools and you know this, that, and the other thing news to me. So, uh, you know, help control the rumor mill. We haven't made any decisions. We're just beginning to talk about all the options that are on the table. Uh, so I can't stress enough. We haven't made any decisions, but I'm sure that you'll hear a lot of talk out there that, that they have been. So what's the budget situation look like? This is something that I shared with our staff. Um, it's a little bit different form. But about six weeks ago, I started talking to our staff, you know, what might the impact of the Kansas revenue shortfall be on the district? And I just, you know, kind of <coughs> came up with some numbers if they were going to make cuts and make cuts to education. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to hold the legislators and the governor's feet to the fire on their campaign and re-election promises that they won't cut school funding. But if they did, if they give us our share of what the cuts were, uh, would have been before elections, you'd have been looking at about $1.2 million to our district. And then they came out on the 10th of this month with some revenue projections that said, no, it would be double that number. So it's really imperative that we stress to our legislators, uh, you can't cut public education because quite frankly, I don't know where we'll come up with that kind of money. We could do it, but it would be really, really ugly and really devastating to kids. 
issues that we have that are kind of our own issues unique to Hutchinson are some other reasons why we need to have these conversations. Because even if our state funding remains uh, flat, it doesn't decrease, it just, just maintains, we have some budget shortfalls that we need to deal with internally. We have been, over the last four years since the recession hit, making a conscious decision to spend down our cash balances. So we've been deficit spending as a school district to the tune of about $380,000 a year. Why have we done that? Well, that seemed to be a lot wiser thing to do than to cut $380,000 worth of services because our hope was when the economy turned around, school funding would be restored. But then that didn't happen. Then our hope was, okay, this, the school finance lawsuit will make them restore funding. But when that got remanded back to the district court, that kind of delayed that decision a bit. So the four years that we have spent down that money, $380,000 every year, we're now to the point we don't feel like we can do that anymore. Uh, our cash balances basically are what we use as a district when the state is late with its payment to us, we still have to make payroll to all of our employees. They, they kind of depend on that. Uh, I'm sure everybody does. We can't be late with our payroll. Our vendors that we, you know, the utilities, you know, we have to keep the lights on just like everybody else. In order to run the district, our average monthly expenses, payroll and other, other bills are $4.7 million a month. So if the state is two months late with payments, we have to have a little over $9 million that we can use until we get finally get a check from the state. Um, we're at that level right now, so we can't keep spending those cash balances down. So we have to find that $380,000 in our budget. Um, declining enrollment, as I said, I'm kind of anticipating that might be about 20 students next year, looking at the size of the senior class that will graduate we will lose funding for those students we were already down some this year so the average the way that the average works um, will for sure have at least one hundred and twenty thousand dollars in lost enrollment unless some students come from somewhere that we're not expecting then if you figure just a little bit of inflation of a hundred thousand dollars just to cover some minimal things like maybe utilities or property insurance going up, those kinds of things that when the bill comes on the property insurance, you sort of have to pay that. There, there really is not any way that you can cut back on that. Um, we put $100,000 in for that. And then when you want to fund your salary schedule, you're looking at about another $650,000. So even if you don't pay any attention to the line on the top, because we, we assume that the legislature, the governor, will fund education at least at the current level and not cut us anymore, we still have a significant amount of money that we have to come up with. And that's why we're here tonight, to talk about that. And then if our health insurance would increase, you know, that would be another cost that I wouldn't have any idea, you know, how to put a number on that. So you can see long term going forward, we have some challenges. We have to figure out how do we get more efficient, how do we do some things differently, and how do we do it still protecting the kind of well-rounded education that we want our children to have in Hutchinson. Now one of the things that always comes up when we start talking about budget cuts is people put a lot of ideas on the table that are things like, well, reduce copies, or you know, don't buy as many library books, or you know reduce cleaning supplies you know they'll come up with all the things that they can think of to reduce that are not positions well for the last five six years we've been making those kinds of reductions we really can't reduce much of those things any further um oops and while we would like to say we're not talking about positions the reality is that most of our budget is salary and benefits. It's people. That's just the kind of, of industry that we are. We're very labor intensive. So about 81% of our budget is salary and benefits. And the other 19% goes for those things that it's really difficult to cut. It's busing. It's the utility bill. It's 
you know, you have to replace the computer technology when it wears out. It's software licenses for the kinds of online things that the children use. So it's a lot of things that it's very difficult to just not have without really changing the services that we, we have in place. So our objective would be that as we talk about positions that might be eliminated, number one, to understand all of these positions do something that's needed and the people in them work very, very hard. Uh, none of the positions we would talk about would be things that we want to not have anymore, but that's really the situation that you're in when you need to balance the budget and you've really kind of cut just about everything else that you can, that we're really to that point, so I want everyone to realize that. Uh, the other thing that you need to be aware of that I want to share this evening is just the idea of, we call them buckets of funding. Our funding comes from unique places and there are lots of strings attached to the money that we get and we just can't spend it however we want. The money that we're going to talk about reducing our, is the money we get from the state and it's our general fund budget. And then we also have our local option budget, also called the LOB, and it's related to the general fund budget because we can levy on our local taxpayers up to 30% of what the general fund is that we get from the state. That's the money that for the most part doesn't have too many strings attached to it. We can pretty much buy whatever we want to with that money. We have other money that's very restricted what we can do with it. Capital outlay is right now you can do things with your building. So you can repair your buildings, you could build a new building, you could purchase property, that's what you can do with capital outlay. Now we are looking at um, a new resolution that would allow <coughs> us to expand what we can use the capital outlay for slightly, <coughs> would allow us to not only replace things in the building, uh, like carpet and a roof, but also pay custodial and maintenance salaries to take care of the building. Um, so that's something that uh, the board just passed that resolution to look at changing the way we can spend that money and also raising that mill levy slightly um, gives us the ability to go up to eight mills. Right now it's at four. Not that they would go to eight mills right away, but it would give them that flexibility. So that's something that we do have some local control over. But that bucket of funding is limited. You can't pay for teachers with it. You can't uh, pay for professional salaries or anything like that with that money. Uh, federal money is very limited in what we can do with that. So sometimes people will suggest, you know, eliminating a particular position and we say, mm, yes, but that position is paid for with federal money so it doesn't help us balance this budget any. All you can do is buy some other service that qualifies for, for that pot of money to be spent upon. So sometimes people will ask questions about, well, you know, this, this special teacher or that special teacher, why do we have them? They most likely come out of a particular pot of money, such as Title I. Title II is mostly our professional development money. Pretty much all we can do with that is buy professional development, professional learning for teachers from it. Um, our bond and interest funds, pretty, pretty self-explanatory what that's for. That pays off the debt on our buildings. That's all you can use that for. And special education is a unique pot of money that we get. It can only go for special education. And we have to add general fund money to that bucket because it's never enough to provide all the services that we have to provide under the law. And the other interesting thing about special education is you have to maintain effort, which basically means you can't reduce the amount of money that you spend on special education. So if uh, you say, well, there's a position that's a special education position, we'll cut that. You can cut it, but you just have to spend it on something else in special education. So you can rearrange what's in that pot and what you buy, but the amount of money always has to stay constant or you violate some federal law. So those are some of the rules and regs that go along with the different buckets of funding that we have to deal with. That just makes things a little more challenging. So with that in mind, um, What's our process going to be as we talk about balancing our budget? Well, we're going to consider ways that we can raise revenue as a district and take a balanced approach. 
Uh, so we'll try to raise some revenue if necessary and make some reductions as well. Um, I already said our board is looking at the ability to be able to raise our capital outlay mill levy if they need to. Um, we have a little bit of room left in our local option budget as well, which is another way that the district can, can raise some revenue. So we have those options available to us and that will be something that our board will have to weigh carefully um, as we go forward and once we know better exactly where we are with our budget because we never really know until the legislature actually tells us this is the money that you're getting for next year. But we've got those things in our back pocket that we can raise some revenue. So, so that's good news because a lot of districts, they have already maxed those funding sources out. So we're in a lot better shape than most. Other things we'll do then is begin to look at what are ways that we can reduce our expenses. Um, we're going to consider all the options that staff and community people have given to us. And we have uh, a number of suggestions that I have collected from our staff. Uh, sometimes community members give me suggestions. And I have compiled them into a list and we will, before we are all done with this process, be looking at those. And I will be sharing with you s some suggestions that have been made and why we won't consider them because they fall into one of those special buckets. Um, or we may talk about why it just isn't a very good idea, maybe a particular suggestion, but we will, we will talk <coughs> through those. Um, and as I said, you know, all, all indications are the legislators aren't intending to repeal any of the income tax cuts, but you know, they might change their tune if they get a different ruling from the court that makes them, um, but it, at least it doesn't seem like they're going to give us any money in the near future of their own accord, you know, to go into to public education. So the kinds of reductions that we need to make are the kinds of things that are sustainable over time, not the sort of things that you want to say, well, we just won't buy that for a year or two because it becomes very difficult to put those things back in the budget. We have made those kinds of decisions as a district um, over the course of time. When I came, we had no money in any line item to replace any kinds of vehicles in the district that wore out. Okay, well, here we are. I've been here for four years. You have to, you have vehicles that wear out. There's no, here's the budgeting plan long term to, to pay for those because we took that out of the budget. That was a reduction that we thought would be for the short term and yet here we are. We haven't been able to put that back yet. We did the same thing with library books. So my point is, we've got to be really careful saying, well, we just won't buy that for a year. One year becomes two, becomes three, becomes four, and that equipment is worn out, or those books are worn out, and you have no way to put it back in the budget. So we really need to be looking at things that are sustainable for the long haul. And that means that we really need to make some fundamental changes to how we do business. Um, you know, what do we look at? in order to make sustainable cuts. And we don't have all that many options open to us. We can find ways to increase class sizes at the high school level, the middle school level, even the elementary level. Um, we can reduce programs or eliminate programs. I think that's a pretty painful option because as we saw last year when we began talking about, you know, maybe reducing librarians or reducing art, you know, people really value those kinds of experiences for their kids, uh, which is why I'm saying, you know what, instead of dying deaf by a thousand paper cuts to our programs, let's start really taking a hard look at class sizes. And can we balance those out in different ways across the district that maybe it becomes more palatable to do that than lose some of the programs that are very dear to our kids. Um, and we can look at making changes to how some of our services are provided, like transportation, which could mean maybe we don't transport s some students that we are, but it can also mean, um, in the case of busing, one of the things that we do, we contract out our busing services. Maybe that's something that we need to figure out how to get back in the busing s business as a district. I think we could save some money that way. Um, so that's something that will take a little bit of creative thought to figure out how to do that. But it's those kinds of major things that, that we're going to have to take a look at. So our order of discussion is going to be this. I thought we would start with the most complex issue first. 
And the thing that really impacts the largest number of kids, the largest number of families, really looks at how do we balance or how do we increase class sizes at the elementary level because no matter what you do, it involves changing boundaries and whenever you change boundaries, you know, that impacts a lot of people all over the community. And that's not, that's not a simple thing to talk about. And we want to be sure that we have adequate time to study all of those possibilities. Hopefully, if the budget situation is not as bad um, as I feared it might be, meaning that the state doesn't cut education further, we would have this year to figure out what the best solution is, and next year, that if we're making changes to the elementary structure in any way, we've got a year then to figure out what does that look like, how do we do that, and you wouldn't be implementing changes like that until the 16-17 school year. Why are we looking at elementary schools? Well, you know, regardless of what we do with, with the budget, I really think the time has come that we need to look at elementary schools in our district um, because the class sizes right now really vary quite widely. And so if you, you got the handout and you take a look at that, you will notice average class size is not too bad in our district. But if you look at a school like, say, Morgan, and you look across there and you see what the, the sizes of classrooms are at all the different grade levels, in that building, and then you compare it to one of the other buildings, like maybe Avenue A, you'll notice some of those class sizes are pretty small, and yet Avenue A has um, a kindergarten that's just quite large. So we have great discrepancy across the district where those class sizes are. They're, they're not balanced out very well. Um, and so I think our time has come that we're going to have to look at those issues because additional pressure will be put on different schools as the Oxford Estates and the Wiley Boundary Area has houses begin to grow, as the Wiley Building in the Lincoln District opens. As all of those things happen, that's going to change enrollment patterns. So we're going to have to do a boundary study anyway. So if we're going to redraw boundaries, it would seem to make a lot of sense to me to be having this conversation at the same time so that we don't change boundaries and then decide, gee, we need to do something, we're changing boundaries again. We need to come up with a solution that can be long lasting so we're not disturbing families and enrollment every year or two as enrollment patterns continue to change a little bit. Um, we're also looking at elementary because when we are talking about budget, increasing average class size is really a, a pretty good way to significantly reduce salary expenses over the long term. So if you look at the number of classrooms that we have, say at the elementary level, and you distribute the students more evenly than what we've done now, you can actually take one track, and a track is what I call like one kindergarten, one first, one second, one third, you know, all the way up through K-6, of seven teachers. If you take seven seven classrooms out, minimum savings there is $350,000. That's the cost of the teacher, the benefits, all of the payroll taxes that we have to pay. That's kind of your minimum amount of money. Well, if you only take one class out or two classes out and divide that into the total number of kids, the class size really isn't any bigger than the size of classes that Morgan has right now. It's just that it's not divided out very evenly across the district. So that becomes a fairly significant amount of money um, just by moving some kids around. So I think that that's something that it makes sense for us to really take a good look at. Um, and as I said, our current configurations are going to require some, some boundary changes regardless. So how do we better balance our class sizes and maybe save some money in the process? Um, another thing that I have noticed with the way that our schools are currently structured, and we may choose to continue to have them structured this way, um, but right now the feeder pattern of our schools, you'll notice if a school begins with two kindergarten classes, most likely it still has 
two sixth grade classes. Wiley is a bit of an exception because we've had an increase of students up in that area, so for a while it, it's had some um, additional teachers at the primary level. But for the most part, what you start with is what you finish with. There's not really a way to have maybe three or four kindergarten classes with smaller class sizes and then have larger class sizes as the kids get a little older and could perhaps handle larger classes without it being detrimental to their learning. Because what you start with is what you finish with. That's just the way it kind of moves through the building. Um, you know, might there be advantages to some different type of configuration of kids in buildings so that we could actually have smaller class sizes in our primary grades and a little bit larger class sizes at the upper grades. Um, if, for example, we got a significant increase in funding in the next few years because of the school finance lawsuit, we might decide as a community we would really like to lower class sizes in kindergarten or maybe even kindergarten and first grade. The way our buildings currently are set up, there really wouldn't be any way to do that. You just don't have the classroom space and, and you'd have to just cut the numbers in half and, and, and move them. It just wouldn't be really smooth to do that, but there might be some ways to do that if we were willing to configure the buildings differently. So again, that's just another idea trying to think <coughs> long term. So that's why we're going to start our conversation thinking about elementary schools. Um, we will be looking at six different ideas tonight and the meeting two weeks from now. Oops, I moved, didn't I, Ray? I promised Ray I would stay right here. It's really hard for me. Um, we have six different ideas that have been put on the table that might be workable. We have not studied any of them in great depth. But the reason that we wanted to uh, start with elementary, Elem what we do at elementary has the potential to ripple on through the grade levels and impact middle school and even impact high school in some ways. So originally we thought we'd divide up into elementary, middle, and high school right away with our budget conversations, but I visited with uh, Mr. Reem and Mr. Patterson and we decided, you know, we'd start the conversation with elementary because we thought, you know what, there are middle school and high school people that probably will see that connection and may have some things that they want to share, their insight for how these different configurations could impact those grade levels on up the chain. So different things that we have for ideas. Removing a track of K through six, so that would be one kinder, one first, one second, one third, fourth, fifth, all the way up through sixth grade. If you need to save more money, you can take two tracks. But let's say we remove one track of K through six. <coughs> How could you do that? One way would be to repurpose our smallest building. That's Avenue A. It basically has one class of everything. There's one class that we split. Um, but essentially, it's a one-track school. You could use Avenue A for something different. We have some other less efficient buildings in the district, like Hutcherson Center or like our ESC building where we have <clears throat> some special education programming, Grandview. We could take any one of those buildings and move some of those programs to still use that building, Avenue A, but not use it as a K-6 building anymore if we wanted to. Um, another idea, simply remove a track from one of the larger buildings like McCandless or Morgan, go from a three-track school to a two-track school there essentially accomplishes the same thing. Other ideas would be to reconfigure attendance centers. Now as you reconfigure, you're also still removing a track. So everything involves removing a track. That's where financial savings comes from. Um, we can still keep um, Allen Magnet School as a K-6 Magnet School, or if we decide we really like the Magnet School concept, we could have the magnet school concept you know, spread across a couple of buildings. But one idea would be a K-3 buildings that feed into 4-6 buildings. So children would attend school kindergarten through third grade in a building, and then they would have a building that they all moved together. That would be their feeder building. 
Same idea, more transitions. You could do that with a K1 building, feeding to a 2-3 building, feeding to a 4-6 building, and of course we have several of those across the district. Um, you could also do perhaps a K5 buildings feeding into one large mid-size sixth grade center. So you could take one of the buildings that's um, that holds around 400 kids or more and you could make that into the sixth grade center. So we have some buildings that would work for that. So that would be an idea where you'd have several K through five buildings all feeding into one sixth grade center. And then another idea would be that K-5 building, several of those, and then taking the middle schools from their seventh grade, eighth grade, and making it into two middle schools that were sixth through eighth grade in each one. I'm not sure that all the kids will fit. As I said, we have not studied these in great depth. Um, if they did all fit, it would require um, using ev every classroom, every period of the day. So teachers would not have their planning period with their room all to themselves. So there would be kids in there and another teacher coming in. So just know if you did that, that's a little bit of logistically how that might be able to work. And we would have to crunch some numbers a little bit more to see if that really is a possibility. So those are the different uh, different ideas that we're going to study this evening. So I've thrown a whole lot at you. What questions <coughs> might you have about the six options here before we dive in? Does anybody not understand what I mean by one of those options? <coughs> yes, sir. One of the things you may run into if you're going to do six through eight buildings, because I, I know of a school district out in Colorado that did something like that to consolidate split back to the One of the things that I would want to check personally if we did that would be if we could continue the idea of it's one building, two separate campuses, so you could still combine the athletic program. Seems to me like that <coughs> might be the yeah, way to go, but like I said, that would need a lot more I study. Think transportation. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, my, qu my, my question is, do you have any questions about what I mean by this? Because we'll get into what the pros and cons are as we actually discuss them. Every one of these is going to require redrawing boundaries. Okay. So you're going to have to move where the boundaries are so that you fit the kids into the amount of sections that you have. So every single one of these is going to reconfigure boundaries. Good question. <coughs> Any other questions? You right. said that removing a track would save $350,000. How much more would shutting a building down? You, you mentioned removing a track like from Avenue A and then using that building for something else, I assume you would shut down another building. And that would depend on what the other building would be that you would decide not to use. And when we get into our discussions, there's a, one of the things that you'll ask is what else do you want to know? And that would be a great thing to put on that is what other information do we need, need to bring? When I say we haven't made any decisions and we haven't studied any of these in a huge <coughs> amount of detail, I am I am dead serious. We, we have not looked at that, but I know that depending <coughs> on what you would decide to do uh, would probably influence what building you would want to close and <coughs> move that program to Avenue A, because I'm sure there would be some cost differentials there. Any other questions? Okay, this is how we are going to um, group <coughs> ourselves. Ray, while I'm doing that, would you count how many people that I have? Although I'll help. 72. 72. You are so good. Thank you. Um, <laughs> leave it 71. 71. She's 71. All right. She's going to depart us. I have to leave too, Lord. <laughs> okay. Six, that will work. 70. <laughs> okay. We have three things that we are going to discuss. We are going to spend time talking about different options. 
Tonight, we will not, your group will not get to all of them because we have six different groups. They're divided around the room. Each group represents one of the options that was just up there. So between tonight and our next <coughs> meeting, you will get to give input and have discussion about each one of those topics. You're going to go to a station and I'm going to divide you into a couple of groups and you're going to talk about what might some of the benefits <coughs> be of that particular idea and what might <coughs> some of the drawbacks be to that particular idea. So your color group is going to go to your color and then actually divide yourselves into kind of an A and a B group with one group doing the benefits, one group doing the drawbacks. Then you're going to switch and add to the conversation. And then you're going to come together as a group. And the third piece of paper is, what additional information would you want to know <coughs> about this idea when we really you know, get going on it? If this is something that we really decided we were interested in, it seemed to have a lot of advantages, more advantages <coughs> and drawbacks. What other information would you want brought to future discussions because you will think of questions that that never occur to me that, that you will want to know that. So that's why we want to ask that. Um, so you have different colored dots. We're going to come down to your group. I'll tell you where they are. And then like I said, once you get there, you'll divide yourselves into kind of an A group and a B group, so you can like number off one to two or just divide yourselves evenly. I think you're adults, you can figure out how to divide into two even groups. You will need to select someone to be the recorder for the group. So somebody has to take the lead, pick up the marker. If you can't decide, then you know it's the person that has the shortest hair. But if you can come to a way to decide who wants to, to be the recorder by some other way, <laughs> then you can do that. I will give you seven minutes to have the initial conversation around your piece of paper. And then my little timer will go off and I'll tell you to switch. So you'll switch within your group. Read what the other group has. Add any additional things that you can think of. I'll give you five minutes to do that. Then my little timer will go off again, and then you guys will all meet in the middle and come up with what additional information do you want to know. So that's going to take just a little over 15 minutes to do all of that in one group. Once we've done that, then we're going to rotate clockwise, and we'll keep going until we're about out of time. Now the key is you have to remember what color dot you have because when we come back next week, or in two weeks, you'll pick up with the next group that you haven't gone to yet and your color is going to help you know, well like I'll tell you, okay the green was here and the blue was here. So you got to remember what color you are so that you get to discuss everything. What questions do you have about what we're going to do and what the directions are? Okay, here are where your groups are located. Green is down here. So here's the green group. And your little tag tells you what you're talking about. The black group is over there. I believe the brown group is over there by the thermostat. The red group is down here. 